Hello, I'm Nick Kitchen and welcome to LSE Ideas. The Arab Spring spread from Tunisia to Egypt's Tahrir Square, which became something of a model for the protests that followed throughout the region. Why do you think that is? Well, so the protests began in Tunisia, but it was really the expansion of protests in Egypt that took that model that regimes could be overthrown by popular protest and made it portable. And what the Egyptians did between the fall of Ben Ali in Tunisia and the fall of Mubarak in, in Egypt was create a model. And that model was really simple. I call it the Tahrir Square model. And what protesters did is they continuously occupied Tahrir Square and they were periodically reinforced on organized name days, usually Fridays, by, by relative moderates. And what they did is they were able to expand the number of people out there and grow the population of people in the protest site to the point where it threatened the regime. Now that model was very portable. But the big question is, why did that then spread to some Arab countries and not others? You called it the Arab Spring. I think now Greg Gauz uh, from University of Vermont calls it the winter of Arab discontent, which I think is a better, better phrase for it. But so here's the puzzle. Why did it spread to some Arab countries and not others? Why did it spread to Syria and Libya and Yemen and Bahrain, but not to say Algeria or Morocco or Jordan to the same extent? People looking at that have typically looked at the difference in regime type. So it was much more likely to spread to the republics than to the region's monarchies. I think it has a lot more to do though with the spatial layout of the capital cities. So that model that you mentioned sees the central square. Everybody in the Arab world was inspired by what happened in Egypt, but only in some places did people see that model and collectively know how their fellow citizens would apply that model and critically where they would apply that model. So some countries in the Arab world have what I call a latent focal square, a square that everyone in the country would see as a domestic, uh, 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 a domestic version of Tahrir Square. And so countries that had central focal squares were much more likely to have uprisings. Those that did not have central focal squares had staccato protests that were dispersed in time and space, but never got to the point where they could grow into the numbers that would overthrow the regime or challenge the regime. So what I'm able to do is look at the spatial layout of capital cities and people's collective understandings of that space and explain why that Egyptian model diffused to some countries and not others. Now here's what I think is really neat. There's three reasons why some countries don't have central focal squares. Countries that had a monarchy but then overthrew that monarchy built a giant square to commemorate the overthrow of those monarchies. So those are publics that used to be monarchies, right? Iraq, Yemen, Libya. They have central focal squares because they built these squares or refurbished them to commemorate that overthrow. The republics that were never monarchies, such as uh, uh, Algeria, they never had a central focal square like that. So my theory can explain not just the variation between republics and monarchies, but variation among their publics. But it can also explain variation among the monarchies because the one monarchy that had a central focal square was Bahrain. Pearl Roundabout, built 1982 to commemorate the first GCC meeting in, in Bahrain. It was on the back of the coin, the back of the, the 50, uh, like 50 fills coin in Bahrain. And so e Bahrainis knew that other Bahrainis saw it. They saw it almost every single day. I think I have a copy. I think I have one of the coins right here. There's an image of Pearl Roundabout on the coin. This is no longer legal tender in Bahrain, of course, right? After the Bahrainis used Pearl Roundabout to challenge the regime, the regime pushed them out, tore down Pearl Roundabout. So this, what used to be the highest denomination coin in Bahrain, is, is no longer legal tender, but makes a great souvenir if you ever find yourself in the Gulf. Uh, so I think my theory can account for the variation not just between republics and monarchies, but even within those two groupings. It's a very interesting theory, and you know, there's a nice irony there. Um, but are you really telling us that uh, actually it's the geography of capitals that was determining mm -hmm. in whether uh, you know, protests spread and not the political situation or the economic situation. You know, there, there, there's a correlation here, but aren't there other far more significant variables when we're talking about the evolution of what we probably don't call the Arab Spring? People like to point to certain factors, but when you look at the entire universe of Arab countries, places where protests did occur and did not, a lot of those conventional explanations don't hold a lot of water. So it's true that countries that had a lot of oil wealth, for example, didn't have uprisings, but also countries that had almost no oil or hydrocarbon wealth, they had very few protests as well. So there is sort of a relationship between countries that had some oil wealth, but not a lot of it. 
But in terms of countries that were, were more free than other countries that had regularized elections, they were no more likely to have mass uprisings than the ones that were much more authoritarian. Syria and Libya were among the most authoritarian countries in the region, didn't have uprisings. Uh, I'm sorry, they did have uprisings. Other countries that have very experienced opposition groups and had free, relatively free elections for the region, many of them, such as Jordan, did not have uprisings. So a lot of the factors that people have identified haven't been able to explain the whole range of variation that we see in the Arab Spring. And I think the Square's explanation says a lot, not, not just about the Arab Spring and the diffusion of the Tahrir Square model, but I think it also speaks to this larger issue of the role of squares in protests we see around the world. Uh, Ukraine, uh, uh, China were recently commemorated the anniversary of the Tiananmen uprising. Uh, so I think there's a, a larger, uh, some larger questions here about the role of space uh, and the role of space and capitals and how that helps protesters and in some ways constrains them. David Patel, thank you very much.